So John chapter 6, you can find it in the center of your worship program. Uh, John 6, 1 to 15, the feeding of the 5,000. And all of chapter 6 of John, all 71 verses are going to be about the feeding of the 5,000. We do the the first part of it now. And also, if you're a note taker, this title that says Lost and Hungry is going to be the test. The test. And I tell you that before I read the text because maybe you'll see some things in the text. Please listen as I read the Word of God. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs, because he, they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing a large crowd was coming, coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each one of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Have you ever seen something so often or been so familiar or exposed to something so many times that it just becomes second nature? You you get used to it. You look past it. Maybe a familiar scratch or a ding on the car that really upset you when it first happened, but now you don't even see it. I've told you this before, and and now, personally, it's a running joke. Maybe it's not for my wife, who has to live with it, but three years ago, three and a half years ago, there was a leak in our house, in the second floor, between the second floor and and the kitchen, and a plumber had to come, and he had to cut out a piece of drywall about that big, about the size of a sheet of paper. I know that because... It's three and a half years later, and I have a sheet of paper covering the hole in the ceiling. (laughs) And I don't even see it anymore. It matches the paint perfectly. (laughs) I mean, it was a hole for a few months, and the first couple weeks of the hole being there really bothered me, and I was always trying to see how I was going to patch it. I've never done drywall work, but then there's also... Well, do we paint the ceiling after we patch it? And, you know, all this discussion and well, how much of it do we paint? And, and finally I said, well, I got other things to do. And I put that sheet of paper over it and that just became the repair. <laughs> I'm sorry, honey. How about you? Do you know what I'm talking about? Is there any damage in your house or to something that you, it really upset you? It really was a big deal, and now you don't even see it. It could come in the reverse, too, by the way. It could be a beautiful scenery or sunset or view or overlook. I mean, is there a place that you went to the first time you saw it, and you were just so in awe, and so you've gone back, and now you can just drive by it and not even notice it? For me, I, I, I head north from the church, I think it's called 52, I still don't know the roads around here, and, and past Childress Vineyards and the hotel there, and North Carolina, one thing I've always loved about it is the most beautiful sunsets. 
I mean, the sun could set over there, but the whole sky would be gorgeous. And somehow over those vineyards, the sunset is beautiful. I don't know if you've seen this. And now I don't even notice it. Beautiful things can become normal. I think that's why I love the seasons, by the way. South Florida has no seasons. Most of Florida does. I'm, it's not a joke. I mean, it could be 80 degrees in the winter. And yeah, sometimes it's 50. But nothing really changes. But here you get changes, and then you remember. And as life explodes in the spring, it's just a welcome reminder of new life. And then in the fall, when the colors change, it's a reminder of God as an artist. So I'm glad for that. But in general, if there's something we see repeatedly or do repeatedly, it becomes second nature. I mean, even drives. Sometimes I'm driving, and, and all of a sudden I forget where I've been and where I'm going. Because you're just like on autopilot. Does it happen to you when you read the Word of God? It was going somewhere with that. This story that we we just heard, the feeding of the 5,000, is one of the most well-known stories in Jesus' ministry. It should be. It's in all four Gospels. It is the only miracle of Jesus Christ in all, all four Gospels. You probably know that. Maybe you don't. Besides the resurrection, which obviously is the greatest miracle. But the only miracle Jesus does for the crowds, on the crowds, for the people, that's in all four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is this story. You ever thought about that? Like, I can actually think of, to me, much more spectacular miracles. One of my favorites is Jesus walking on the water, which we'll see next week. It always happens right after this story. You guys know I just love water and being out on the water and the fact that, I mean, walk on water, that's cool. Only three times in the Gospels. Lazarus getting raised from the dead, very popular. That's only in John's Gospel. In the other Gospels, Jesus does raise a little girl from the dead. But do you ever wonder why this story is in there three times? It's familiar. And you've probably heard it from the time you were a child if you grew up in the church, maybe in that very wing over there. You probably read it dozens of times, studied it dozens of times, heard sermons on it dozens of times. I preached it two and a half years ago when we were in Mark chapter 6. Not only are we familiar with it, but it's pretty straightforward. It's a pretty straightforward story, so much to the extent that we think we just know it, right? Right? Jesus will explain later in John's, in this chapter, we're going to see it in the upcoming weeks, that Jesus says, I am the bread come down from heaven. I am the bread of life. He feeds us. He nourishes us. It's straightforward. But there's so much more to the story than this. It's so deep. If you were to explain the feeding of the 5,000 to a non-Christian who didn't grow up in a Christian home, so has no context of the Bible, doesn't know about Moses or Abraham or any of that, and they asked you, why does it say Jesus is the bread of life? What does that mean? How would you explain it? Could you explain it? Could you explain it to your kids? What if your kid asked you that? There's a test. Go home today and at lunch, have a discussion on it. What does it mean that Jesus is the bread of life? Why is this miracle of feeding 5,000 people so significant that it's in all four Gospels? Why I entitled this sermon, The Test, is because it is kind of a test. And Jesus says that in verse 6, or the, the text says that. When he asked them, where are we to buy bread so these people may eat, he said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. What's the test? Why on earth should they expect that he's just going to feed everybody? He hadn't done it before. It's, I don't even know that it's, it's a matter of them not thinking he could do it. Just why would you think that? This story is so significant that in Mark's gospel, Mark will indicate that understanding this miracle is the key to understanding every miracle. You know what I'm talking about? 
In the next story, they get on a boat, and Jesus is up on the mountain praying, and we'll see this next week in, in John's gospel, but, but John doesn't make this point that Mark makes. The storm comes, they're scared, Jesus comes walking on the water, and, 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 and he, he, he calms the storm. It says this, and he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded. Why? For they did not understand about the loaves, about the bread, but their hearts were hardened. Verse I just would read over. But then one time when I was teaching through Mark's gospel to a men's group in my old church, you know, you know when you teach something, you've got, you, you, you got to look deeper. And, and, and the verse started to haunt me. Because what does it mean? They're scared on a boat because they're almost going to die from the storm. And it says, because they didn't understand about the bread. I would understand if it would say, because they don't remember the last time they were on a boat, and Jesus was asleep on the boat, and then he calmed the storm. But what is it about the bread that explains why they shouldn't be afraid on the boat? And honestly, we can answer this in a simple fashion too. I get it. Well, he's God. It shows that he's God. Okay, good. Do you ever get scared? Why, why, do, why, why is your heart so hard that you're afraid now? Right? When I went careening across the highway at 60 miles an hour and my life flashed before me because my kids were in the car with me, why was I afraid in that moment? Mark says, because you don't understand the loaves and your heart is hard. What does it mean? What is it about the loaves and understanding them? Why, of all the miracles, is this one held as the key to understanding Jesus walking on the water or healing people or loving us? Do you understand the bread? Do you understand the feeding? We're going to look at John explain this over five weeks, 71 verses. Every one of the next verses in this story are going to be about this. This forms the basis for 70 verses in John's gospel. No other gospel does this, by the way. Mark just leaves this, they don't understand the lows, and causes you to think about it. So as we look at this for, for five weeks, what I want us to do is live in the tension of that question. What is the test? What are you understanding or not understanding about it? Like, like if you're a connoisseur of a fine wine or a food or whatever it is, sifting out the nuances of it and not just guzzling it down. Let's do that. So let's look at this, this test. Like it says in verse 6, Jesus is testing the disciples, but I submit the whole thing is a test. What's the test? The rest of the chapter is going to show that. Jesus will tell them, because they keep going to follow him, and, and he'll say, you're not following me because you ate the, the, you're not following me because you saw the signs, but because you ate the bread. Isn't that the same thing? But Jesus is saying, you didn't get the test. So one thing I want to say is, what does John have to offer? We look at the text, we look what the author does. Like sometimes you may wonder, why is a story in multiple places? Does John say anything different than Matthew, Mark, or Luke? Well, again, I preached through Mark, so maybe you might remember what we saw in Mark. In Mark's gospel, it says this. It doesn't say this in John's gospel. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. Goes on and says, then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. What does it sound like? Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me lie down in green pastures. <laughs> he leads me beside still waters, right? He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness. Jesus, in Mark's gospel, sees them. They're like sheep without a shepherd. He has compassion on them, and he feeds them spiritually first. Leads them in paths of righteousness. And then he feeds them a meal. Prepares a table for them. So Mark, very deliberately, is trying to get us to think of, of Psalm 23. Those details aren't in John's gospel. John's gospel does say there's grass. But John's gospel is all about the Exodus and Moses. I have in your, in your bulletin, you may, have, you may have seen it as we read it, if you followed it. 
all these different places that are helping us to think about this event in the Old Testament called the Exodus. They're right in the text, so in parentheses. And really, verse 1, I meant to have on there Exodus 14, which is the crossing of the Red Sea. In other words, after this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And so there's a, sea, a crossing of a sea, just like in the Exodus. Moses is bringing uh, the, the Jews out of Egypt. They go across a sea. There's a large crowd. Exodus says they followed Moses because they saw the signs. And we see people following Jesus because they saw the signs. Jesus goes up on a mountain, and we see that happen on the Exodus. All the verses are in your bulletin. John mentions the Passover, the other one, at least Mark doesn't. I forget if Matthew and Luke does. The Passover is that significant event that precipitates the Exodus. They're hungry. That's Exodus 16. Verse 6 says, he said this to test them, or test, uh, he said this to test him, to test him, but he's testing the disciples, for he himself knew what he would do. And in the Exodus, in Exodus 15 and 16, the same thing happens leading up to the feeding with the manna in the wilderness. It says this is a test. He was testing them. They get manna in the wilderness, which means every day there's, there's just bread rained down and there's instructions given for this bread in the wilderness that we call the manna, that they're to gather as much as they want for one day, but they had to eat it all in that day. They're not to save up for the next day. Makes us think in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. It's causing reliance on the God who is, is feeding them. Verse 12 in our text, they had eaten their fill, and that's from Exodus 16, 18. And in uh, verse 13, they gathered all the extras, and it filled 12 baskets. Now, what's significant about that? Well, there's 12 disciples, so there's 12 baskets, so one for each. But there's a connection between the, there being 12 tribes of Israel and 12 disciples. And in the tabernacle and in the temple, they were always to have out 12 loaves of bread, representing food for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And so we see this all pictured in this text. The people got it because, verse 14, when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet is, who is to come into the world, quoting from Deuteronomy, where God says to Moses, I will raise up for them a prophet like you. They've already asked, is this the prophet? Now they're sure it's the prophet. Why? Because he did a sign that reminds them of the Exodus. John's point of this is to look back to the Exodus. And if you see in your bulletins on the notes page, I have Moses mentioned in John's gospel. And you see how many times Moses is mentioned. He's been mentioned many times already. John 1, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ, and this was grace upon grace to make us... Be sure of the fact that even Moses was grace. John 1.45, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets wrote. So some acknowledged it. John 3, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. John 5.45 and 46, the past chapter. Jesus says, there is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope, for you have believed Moses you would, uh, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. And then Jesus does this miracle, and they're saying, ah, he's the prophet. They start following him, and they want to make him a king, which is an interesting sort of side note or tangent, because as I've told you, the Messiah or the Christ in the Old Testament was always described individual prophecies as a prophet, a priest, or a king, and yet in the Old Testament, that was only always could be one figure. Sometimes a figure had two of the qualities. Like, for instance, David was a king and a prophet, but he wasn't a priest. And here we see a text that says there's going to be a prophet like Moses, and what do they want to do with him? Make him a king. Because Jesus fulfills all three offices. But my point is, John is very intentionally reminding us of the Exodus and reminding us of the promise of what? 
a new Exodus and a new Moses, but a greater Moses. The Exodus event in the Bible is one of the greatest acts in the Scriptures. There's always two big acts. Of course, you know, I mean, you could, the resurrection of Christ is the greatest, and we, we know. But like in Israel's history, they always recount two things in the Psalms. I think I even heard Pablo pray it. Like we are told to recount God's goodness to us. Creation and the Exodus. Read the Psalms. There's always this retelling of creation, sometimes just in, in one verse and sometimes a whole psalm. And the same thing about the Exodus. Because the, as the feeding of the 5,000 is the most important miracle that Jesus does because it become, forms the key to all the miracles, the Exodus becomes that paradigm for, for how the Jews viewed their life. They are delivered from bondage into freedom. And they want to make Jesus king to deliver them from bondage from the Romans. Because that's what they think the king is there to do. The promise is an eternal kingdom that shall have no end with eternal peace and all the kings of the earth shall come to him. So they think Jesus is the guy and they're right, but they're wrong about how it happens. They're waiting for a new exodus from Rome, not recognizing that the exodus that this Moses is bringing is saving them from themselves, from their sins. We see in the, in the book of uh, 1 Samuel when Saul is a king, and, it's, and, and, and he is called king, and it says he will save his people from the Philistines. And then Matthew's gospel it says, they shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from Rome, from their sins. It's taking a quote from the Old Testament and applying physical bondage to the real deliverance we need. And so they miss it. They recognize he's the prophet, but they don't recognize the mission. What do we learn? I'm just going to let that hang for a second. What do we learn about God from this story? Because if I said we don't really get the significance of this, and I'm trying to make the case that this story is one of the most, if not the most significant miracle Jesus does. It, I'll just say, he, this is the most significant miracle Jesus does aside from his own resurrection. So what do we learn about God from this story? What do you learn? If somebody said, what does that mean about God? He cares about his people. He wants to feed his people. He wants to give his people what? Rest. He tells them to sit down. He wants them to receive from him. We learn that he's actively involved in creation. He's not a distant, aloof God who just looks at the events. Like, Jesus doesn't have to feed these people and nobody's going to die. I don't have to do this. In Mark's gospel, the, it has the disciples come to Jesus and say, Hey, it's getting late. There's a lot of people here. Send them back to their own villages so they can get food. It was an option. It was never conceived as an option that Jesus would decide to sit everybody down and feed them. People are searching for something. They're seeking something. They're hungry. And Jesus wants to be the satisfaction of that search. Quote we quote all the time here in sermons. Probably all three of uh, the pastors here have quoted it. You know, Augustine, like, our hearts are restless, O Lord, until they find their rest in you. And we see Jesus saying, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And he images this here. He's the bread of life. He's the good shepherd. John will teach these things later. Jesus Christ is the, the new Moses, the new deliverer that God has sent to deliver his people. He's the God-man that is sent to deliver his people. And this miracle is going to symbolize that. And I submit to you that the idea of bread and the miracles around bread are pointing to the person and work of Jesus Christ. In everything I already said, the daily provision, the bread come down from heaven, the one who satisfies the needs and the soul, the one who prepares a table for them in the midst of their enemies, as Psalm 23 says. 
But think of all the stories about bread in the Bible, very significantly, and these aren't the only ones, but the manna in the wilderness. And John is going to teach this later. We'll see this in two and three weeks. But in, in, like I've already said, in the temple and the tabernacle, there's always a table of bread saying, you have a, you have a place at the table of God. There's, there's food for you. What about Deuteronomy 8.3? Very few, few people realize what I'm going to read to you is from Deuteronomy 8.3 because we will recognize this out of Jesus' lips when he's tempted by Satan who says, turn these stones into bread, right? And Jesus says what? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And then somebody might say, well, that came from Deuteronomy. Yeah, he's quoting scripture. Let's read it. Deuteronomy 8.2. And you, sh so, so this is the speech to Israel before they're going to go into the promised land. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years. Your whole life, you shall remember how he did that. That he might humble you. Testing you to know what was in your heart. Does that sound like our text? whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know. Why? That he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of God, of the Lord. So few people connect this passage to the feeding of the 5,000. I don't know why. It's, it is the explanation we are being tested physically to point to our need spiritually. And folks, our Savior cares about both. There's no far-off separation between body and soul. A person is body and soul, physical, material, and spiritual. He cares about your physical needs. He cares about your spiritual needs. And this text says that our physical needs point to our spiritual needs and that Jesus Christ is, is the satisfaction of both. I think that's why fasting as a spiritual discipline that we don't really do very much, but it is a spiritual discipline even in the Protestant world, is like, because anybody that's, that's fasted recognizes there's this, this, this really this struggle at the beginning, but then there just becomes this point of like, like it's almost like the fog is lifted and there's this clarity about God's provision and presence in your life. Do you know what I'm talking about? Maybe try it sometime. Maybe a season of fasting and prayer. The Lord's Prayer says, give us this day our daily bread. My father called me on the phone a couple months ago, I think, and he wanted to, he wanted to dig into that phrase, and I love it, because that's what I'm trying to get us to do in this passage, to dig into it. Like, like when, when, when the Lord's Prayer says, give us this day our daily bread, like, that just doesn't mean bread, right? Exactly. Give us this day our daily sustenance, our daily needs, our daily provision, our daily mercies that are new day by day. Give us this day the energy to go into this difficult meeting or the energy to work out a problem with somebody or the, the strength. Give us this day the strength to walk through these these procedures to deal with a stroke, to go through chemotherapy. Give us this day our daily bread. The Lord's Supper, you see hints of this, right? And John is, 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 is deliberately doing this. He's already for five chapters just given this picture of baptism and water was such a, 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 a deep theme for, it'll be for seven chapters, I think. John 1, Jesus is baptized. John 2, Jesus turns water into wine. John 3, you must be born again, born of the water and the spirit. John 4, the woman at the well. John 5, the healing at the pool. John 6, what is it? It's the next story. <laughs> Jesus walks on water. John 7, I am the living waters. Baptism. Now he's talking about the Lord's Supper which we just celebrated last week. And we see that he looks up to heaven and he gives thanks. And we remember that from the Lord's Supper on a Passover, by the way, where he gave thanks and he broke the bread and he blessed it and he broke the bread and he gave it to them. 
And then at the, at the road to Emmaus, the disciples, they don't recognize him because he'd just been dead and he should be in a grave and he's telling them stories and their mind is being blown because he's feeding them by the word of God. And then it says, he gave thanks and he broke the bread and they recognized him. Bread, the breaking of the bread. The giving of the bread, it's significant. In John 12, Jesus will say, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. How is he going to be glorified? Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And then the bread is broken for you, the flesh of Jesus Christ, to feed you. See, the feeding, the bread, this is, this is why Christ came. When we find our food, our sustenance in Christ, when he's our daily bread, and there's no end to the blessing. Did you notice they all had their fill, and then 12 baskets left over? Maybe Ephesians 3 comes to mind. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church. And in Christ Jesus, throughout all generations, forever and ever, amen. It's, it's doxology, which is praise to God when we think of God's overflowing, overwhelming, abundant provision in our lives for every minute detail. Can you not just praise him? And they had more than they could eat. What are some takeaways? We're going to have four more sermons that are going to be the takeaways. John, John's going to explain this, the words of Christ and the events that happen and the unbelief and the belief. I mean, it's all about belief, right? He's testing their faith. And we see that the disciples don't get it. And we know that the next story, as they're afraid on the water, they just still don't get it because it says their hearts are hard. Now, that's harsh. And the reason I say that is because I would be them. I wouldn't expect Jesus to feed 5,000. And I'm on a boat and the thing's about to go under and I love water and white water and you all know that. And I would be afraid and I'd be more, even more afraid at this appearance of a person walking to me on top of the water. I got a hard heart too. They don't get it. The crowds get a little bit. They're following because of the signs, Right? It says that at the beginning of our text and at the end of our text, and then next week we're going to see Jesus say, well, at two weeks he'll say, you're not following me because you saw the signs. You're really following me because you just ate. The, I, you, and we'll, we'll, date, we'll unpack that. That's significant the way Jesus says that. But they recognize him as the prophet, a new Moses, a, a new Exodus. This is the king. They just don't understand that the true bondage they are being released from is the bondage of their sin. That's what they, they, they don't get. And honestly, I don't think we get that. Sometimes we think now that we're Christians and we got, you know, furthering the cause of Christianity means bringing in Christendom politically. And believe me, I, I want a Christian nation as much as the rest of people because that's just a better place to live. But, that, but that's not the mission. The mission is that sinners are saved who live as Christians in a community who then infiltrate the community by infusing it with the grace of Christ. That'll change a place. But Romans 6 says, Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one who you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart. See, it's not just obedience. And that can only come from faith. Romans 8, 15. You did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Because you were in fear. Because you were slaves of yourselves. But you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom you call Abba Father. So Jesus says, pray to God, our Father who art in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Galatians 4, 7, you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son and an heir through God for freedom, Christ has set you free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. So they get that he's the, the prophet and the king. They don't get the bondage they need release from. And there's a third point that I think is, is significant. They don't see him as the all-sufficient, all-sustaining provider of all their needs who is working all things out for their good. He's the bread come down from heaven, the bread of life, our daily bread. 
So the test is, when you're struggling with something, when you're anxious about something, when you're angry about something, when you have a trial in your life, how does this miracle sustain you? How does this miracle provide an explanation? How does this miracle change your mindset? Kids, you're going to be starting schools. By the way, I've been praying for you kids and that you, that you get good teachers because I just, I do remember that. Like the, I was thinking like, what's the anxiety you have before school starts? What was always in my mind, whatever it was, will I, will I be able to do it? Is it difficult? And this class is going to, it's always really about the teacher. So I've been praying that you all get good teachers because I know that can make or break a year. And in that, I'm praying for the teachers. But kids, if you have that anxiety of starting a new school year, Jesus cares. He's in there. He's, he, he doesn't, it, it doesn't miss his, his attention. He's with you, and he's working those things out for you. You know, like... <sighs> Again, my accident this summer in, in, in May, it's finally wrapped up. As a matter of fact, it was awesome how the, the, the last sort of stamp on it, I'll tell you. But like every moment from the time it happened, Memorial Day weekend, until a couple weeks ago when, when the last thing issue of was wrapped up, God was there. He was just, he was just there providing my every need. He was there. As we, as we headed toward the wall, I, I just thought we were all dead. I just, and not a scratch, not a whiplash, not a sore muscle. How do you go from 60 or 70 miles an hour to a complete stop? We, 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 we're in the left lane, made a hard right into a guardrail. <laughs> and not a problem. And then to see that that's not all that happened, the thing spin around and flew up the road and all kinds of other problems, you're like, wow, God, you just like, you buffeted us, you cushioned us. And then all the ways that he just resolved it. Friends from the campground came to help. Got my kids, helped me get my stuff. Another trip back up there, the, the towing place didn't charge me to tow the trailer or to store the trailer because she felt bad for me and it was, that wasn't covered by insurance. I had friends that took time off to go get it with me. The insurance gave us favor. Every step of the way, I wanted to kind of like bully it and force it and be type A in it. And I didn't have to. He just did it. I have to fight. I mean, the, the amount of money they gave me for the, the vehicle. I got this car eight years ago. They gave me what I paid for it. I hope the insurance company, are there. maybe you could be listening. <laughs> Jesus loves you. Finding a new vehicle that I really like. But then, you know, it was hanging over my head. The, the, the ticket, they gave me a ticket. And I don't have anything bad to say about law enforcement or the laws. I'm not, that's not the point. But, like, there was no witnesses and nobody was hurt. There was really no damage. I mean, there was a dent in the guardrail. But I got reckless driving for something that nobody witnessed and there was no evidence of. Because there's a thing that says driving too fast for the road conditions. And obviously, you're driving too fast for the road conditions if your car just spontaneously, the trailer hydroplanes and you spin off the road. And when you look that up in Virginia, just look up reckless driving in Virginia. They scare the life out of you about this thing. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a crime. It's, uh, you know, you get out of a normal ticket, you might pay a lawyer $200. The, the, the starting point of this for a lawyer is 500 up to 1000 and more. And points on the license, and, and that just was like eating me up for two months. And my lawyer would not give me any confidence that he'd get it dropped at all. And I kept saying, why am I going with this guy? <laughs> but he was pretty sure he'd get it reduced, and I, I got that. I got that we're going to throw me in jail because, you know. But, you know. He thought he'd get it reduced, not to a misdemeanor, and it would still be a $500 fine. And then he called me up. And I remember where I was. I love how I can remember things. Because I was in the parking lot of the, the classic in Denton. Is it Denton? 
And I got the call. So I'm sitting in the parking lot. Now, why was I there? Because the seniors were having a lunch in there. And I love eating with my, uh, my gray brothers and sisters because I'm getting gray. Um, so I got this call, and I answered it. And, and, and I'm waiting. I'm waiting for the, the, the hammer to drop. And he said, they dropped the charge. They just dropped them. There's no witnesses. God's got it. Now, what happened if I didn't? What happened if they threw the book at me? He's got it. He's got it. But for some reason, in this event in my life, he was, he, it, he, it was evident he was there. We don't always see him. And now the, the test for me, what's the test for George? The next time something happens, to remember this, even if he doesn't show up that way in that. He's the bread of life. He loves us. What about when we don't get it to wrap up? What about when we don't get it? When we have a hard heart, when we are afraid, when life is crumbling and we're angry at God, what about then? Do you know this text is going to explain that? The last sermon. Because as Jesus explains this and people are angry with him and they leave him, he says everybody's leaving him. So what does he do? He turns to his friends, his closest followers. He says, what about you? Are you going to leave me too? You like it when I give you bread, but you don't like it when I tell you hard things. Are you going to leave me too? And what does Peter say? I love Peter. Lord, Lord, to whom shall we go? Where are we going to go? You alone. I almost, I, I almost picture him saying this weeping. Lord, where, where, where can we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. The words of eternal life. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. You alone have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you're the Holy One of God. You ever been in that place? I had somebody recently come to me, and they're just saying, I'm just struggling with faith. I said, well, then you're in a good place because you're acknowledging it. Say that. Where can you go? Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. A great verse. He's the bread of, uh, of, of life, folks. May we look to him for our daily provision. May we savor this John chapter 6 for the next uh, probably four weeks, five, uh, four more sermons. And if you don't know him, he can sustain you and he'll be with you and he knows you. You can do that through faith. Let's pray.